Hi everyone. Today I am joined by physio Nick Worth. I've known Nick for well for a long time now, um, and I would say he's got one of the most interesting backgrounds in terms of where he's worked. So I'm really pleased to sit down with him and um, quiz him on that and, and work out how he how he ended up in Thailand for, for some time or in, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, so welcome, Nick. Thank you very much. So. Uh, very simplistically, how did you start in physio? How, why physio? Why did you want to do that? Uh, a bit of a strange one, really. I mean, I, I when I was at, at secondary school, I, um, I didn't really have a great idea, a sort of plan of, of what I was going to do. Uh, my sister's a nurse, and she kind of often used to talk about kind of the patient contact stories she had. Um, and, and I kind of was interested in it. And when I was about 16, I had a you know, typical footballer having a, a knee injury. I went and saw a physio um, of what when I look back now the treatment I received was pretty poor but at the time I quite liked it um, and I just wanted to do something kind of physical and active so I don't come from a, a footballing background if you like I, you know mine was entirely you know went through A levels uh, applied to university and then carried on from there really so yeah it wasn't always my dream to be a physio I probably didn't quite know all of the other areas of physio other than the sports side when I went into it so it was an interesting kind of experience for me. And so how did you get into football then? So how did that, if you, that wasn't a particular interest, how did that happen? Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've always been a football fan. I'd always played public football. I wasn't an ex-pro or anything like that. So I qualified and then uh, worked in South London in the NHS very briefly. Um, but I started working when, when a colleague of mine was giving up a rugby club. So in Stratton Croydon it was. Um, and it was just a, you know, a few quid and just covering games and, and learning a bit of sports stuff. And this was someone who I quite aspired to. And actually within the team, people were then going, actually, you're really good at this and you know, you're better than what we've had before. And it was weird because it gave me that spark to go, actually, maybe you can do it. When I'd never really felt that I was going to. And, and at those t in those times, I mean, I qualified in 93, which shows how long ago it was. You know, you know, there were, it was like one physio with it to a football team. You know, you didn't have these massive teams that were there. So I was working in the NHS doing a bit of rugby um, on the evenings and weekends, playing Sunday league football. Um, and there was a job advert in the Daily Mail, bizarrely, for uh, an assistant physio at Sheffield Wednesday when they were in the Premier League. So I had applied for some other jobs. I applied for Barnet, that kind of thing. I'd had interviews and, and not got them. And was thinking maybe it's not going to be me or it's a closed shop. So it was a bit of a out the out the blue um, happened to be a Daily Mail advert. So um, literally, my the, the, the secretary receptionist that I used to work at said, "Look, you should apply for this." I went for it. There were two or three people subsequently being become friends that were probably higher up the pecking order. But apparently, I did well at interviews, and that's where it started for me. So I went straight into the Premier League as it was at that time, uh, working as a reserve physio. That's amazing then. So that is absolutely bizarre to think it was in a, a Daily Mail, just seeing that. Yeah. I mean, you can't imagine that now, can you, in terms of... No, I, I, absolutely. I mean, it, it was a little tiny advert, um, like in, in, in the sports pages, and I, it was a day that I was off. So, you know, I could have easily not... You know, I, I don't, I didn't, and still don't read the Daily Mail. Um, you know, it was something that someone else found, and I, I applied because I was interested and thought I'd have a go. So... Um, you know, to actually get the job was a bit of a surprise to me. And, and also, the time I did my interview, it was it snowed up there. Um, and they were worried about whether I was going to be able to drive up the motorway to, 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 to actually get home safely. It was that it was one of those kind of weird stories. But apparently, I did really well at interview and, and as a result, got the job from there. So you mentioned you mentioned a bit before that the um, players liked what you were doing more than the other physio. You got that. What do you think? Do you know what it was that the, the team liked about your characteristics? Um, one of the things I would say, and it's, one of the, it's a great advantage, I would say, for people who are looking in to get into sport, is actually playing sport myself. So the, the, the kind of team, um, uh, you know, sort of changing room mentality was something that I'd always enjoyed. You know, I'd always played football. You know the banter, the jokes that go on, the, you know, the, the mickey taking and the stuff that's a little bit near the knuckle. And I think kind of coming across that you were able to deal and manage the team situation was something that probably came across. And, you know, look, I was young and enthusiastic in those days. And so I think to a certain extent, you know, 
the fact that I was really interested and really wanted the job probably was the big thing. But I don't think it was physio skills. You know what I mean? It was it was the other skills. You know, the other physio that was before me. And I still think he's a far better physio than I am. But I just think I fitted. Um, you know, being part of the team, and I think that was an important part. How important do you think that is, both in terms of physio, that personal relationship with the, the, the your patients, but also from a football context? Um, uh, yeah, sorry, de absolutely, definitely. I, I used to, there's been several people over the years that I've kind of mentored or worked or I've employed as uh, sort of reserve physios or physios alongside me. And particularly in team sports, the actual physio bit is about 5% of the job. 95% is, I say man management, but person management, you know, managing the individual, the personalities, the pressures, the worries, the, um, the psychological aspects of injury or, or performance. And I do think that's the biggest thing. When you're in a team environment, people are always wanting to, to shoot you down. They always want to feel like you've got it wrong or they've got something that you can't diagnose. But I actually feel that physio in general is actually fairly simple. You know, we have fair, you know, tissues heal at a similar rate. You know, what we do in rehab, it's about working them at the right time at the right level. There's no, we can, we can flower it up like there's a brilliant science to it, but actually it's fairly basic. Moving sensibly and in, in sensible ways and loading the patient at a reasonable time. That's really important. I mean, I, I now do a lot of kind of first contact practitioner advanced physio jobs. And when people come and sort of uh, look at what I do, so they come and so they come and shadow what I do when working with patients. The one thing they always say is about my, the way I speak is quite simple, simple for the patients. I think physio can be overcomplicated. My my feeling is keeping it really simple for a patient and for the team is really important. The the, the people skills are more important than the actual you know, the skills you learn on, uh, you know, like, like manual handling skills. I think it's more about the way you deal with a person. And is that the case? Which we're talking about the player or patient there, but what about the management structure and whoever involved in that? No, I, I agree. Always the same thing. You know, um, it's tough when you're first starting out in sport to be the person that goes and knocks on the manager's door of the morning and just goes, right, your star striker is going to be out for six weeks. You know, that takes some resilience and you, and you learn that. And, you know, some managers almost put it back on you like it's your fault. Other managers are very accepting going, no problem, we'll just move on. Um, and so you've kind of, kind of managed that. And, and, you know, nowadays with having a bigger team, um, there's a sort of shared responsibility. Whereas, you know, in, in the early nineties, you know, you, it was you were the person responsible. You, you did everything. So, you know, knocking on the gaffer's door and saying that someone's out for a long time, you know takes a bit of bravery um and there's been times that i've been shouted at and and called all sorts of names and you've got to develop a thick skin and get on with it because it isn't personal it just feels like it at the time but it's more about the situation that people find themselves in sports a high pressure environment but it's great fun don't get me wrong i loved it but um you know it's not for everyone and have you had any, any instances where either a player has said no i'm not having that or a manager has said yeah, I don't really care what you're saying. Have you, had, have you been overridden many times? Um, I think people challenge you. I, 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 don't, I can't sit here and say that I would say that there's been areas where I've been totally overridden. But certainly players and, you know, uh, players, managers, coaches, sometimes agents try and put pressure on you. Now, there's a little bit where sometimes you'll want to you'll make a definite decision and then a player will go, look, I'm not quite right. And so there's a little bit of a gray area, you have some protection. And similarly, the other way, where you go, okay, there's that time you put a player on the pitch where you think they're not quite there, but 80% of player A is better than 100% of player B. Yeah, then there comes that, those times when um, you almost kind of are on the sidelines watching the match through your fingers going, oh, I can't bear, bear to see whether they're going to break down. But yeah, so there are those times it happens. I don't feel I've been particularly pushed around. Um, there will be times I, you know, other people will perceive that I have, but I've always been quite strong in it. Um, but that's where I think the relationship you have with a manager, they've got to trust you that you're doing the right thing. Um, and that takes time to build up. When, when you have a new manager, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're learning that relationship again you know, from scratch. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting point and question on that is that I think he's kind of moved away from it now, but there's a lot of times where when a manager goes, loads of the staff go, which may include the medical department. Yeah. Have you been involved in that, both in terms of being recruited or from being let go in that scenario? Yeah, I, yeah, several times actually. And, I, and I'm, I, it's good to see now that, um, uh, that that's happening less. It doesn't mean to say it doesn't happen. Um, certainly throughout most of my career, um, the people were changed when a manager changed quite a lot. I was quite lucky. I didn't, it only happened a couple of times to me, but I did see it happening a lot around me. I think one of the first times I would suggest that would be, um, you know, the, the, the team or the medical team being employed by the club was actually at Chelsea under Brian English, where I think it was in the early days of Mourinho, um, where he was very much, you know, Brian English's boss was the chief executive. And also the manager's boss was the chief executive. So where there was ever an issue, it wasn't a question of the boss, the manager saying, right, you have to do this. It was actually, we need to go to a third party and, and resolve issues. I think from my point of view, most of the time I kept my job uh, because people trusted you. I lost it once when I left West Brom. Oh, sorry, not West Brom, when I left Bolton. Um, uh, Owen Coyle wanted to bring his own manager in, is Andy Mitchell, I know Andy well. Um, so that was something they had a relationship previously at Burnley. So, you know, but on the flip side of that is I got the job at Bolton because the previous ma manager, Gary Megson, had, had worked with me before. So you have to accept the, the rough and the smooth. There were times it's benefited and times it hasn't. But I do feel now um, it happens less often. And the idea really is from a medical perspective or a physio or even a sports scientist, you know, you should be doing your best all the time. It doesn't matter who the gaffer is. You're doing your best for the club and for the team and for the individuals you're working at. You know, and I do feel that that should be recognised, that it's not like you're almost... Um, some players play up for a manager, some don't. But medical staff, we should be fairly uh, uniform throughout whatever we do. We try and do the best we can. So luckily it's changed now, and I do think it's changed, people change less often. So you mentioned Bolton there. So when you went in there, Bolton, uh, was that after Allardyce then when he was there? Yeah, so, so uh, Sam Allardyce had, had left. There was Sammy Lee very briefly, and then there was Gary Megson that had come in. And so there were two physios, because Mark Taylor was the main physio under Sam Allardyce, and, and they left at the same time. And then there were two physios between, you know, in the space of a year, I was a third physio to go in there and run the department. So, yeah, it was a big turnover then. <laughs> So, but Bolton always had that. Um, it was what well, they were. They were known for their sports science. So yeah, that's something that you, when you went in there, was that a myth or is that accurate? Um, I, I think there was a bit, a bit of both to it. I think one of the things that Sam Allardyce did really, really well was sold it uh, as a, as a kind of promotional thing. That actually, you know, we've got, we've got sort of tricks and trades going on underneath, the, underneath that you wouldn't believe, and therefore it almost gave an element of fear about the Bolton side because they were fitter and stronger. Um, I think they did use a lot of, of, of what was probably cutting edge at the time technology and they were at the forefront of that. I think what probably happened because there'd been a quick change of three or four physios within a year is we'd, there'd been a, probably a, a jumbling of kind of team ethic or, or a focus. And one of the things that I was particularly kind of strong to try and reintroduce was a back to basics approach. We needed to get good honest hard work and rehab and simple treatments rather than going for all of the machines and all of the things that go ping and that you know we had the they had the um, the oxygen chamber which was i think one of the one of if not the first um cryotherapy units um you know they, they were doing things like that whereas now they're commonplace it was cutting edge at the time but realistically in the position we were in it wasn't used and it was costing a lot so i was part of the you know um dismantling it at the time because there wasn't the benefit it was a cost benefit analysis from that point of view research was a slightly dubious um, so yeah we I came into it and there was a lot of reliance on cutting edge technology but I, which I think a lot of it was very good and certainly was at the forefront of what happens now in terms of for example monitoring GPS but on the other side of that I would say what they did at times is probably went so far ahead they missed the basics and my my thing was to marry the basics in with their further technology mm. yeah it's interesting because you would go into exton training ground and you you wouldn't instantly think this is cutting edge when you you were going 
no and I, I mean it wasn't but you know it was i think because it developed so quickly you know in the time when when for example mark taylor was first sort of introduced at bolton you know it was fairly basic but then they extended and extended and extended and so in the, in the space of a few years it, you know it really did improve and probably it was almost going at such a pace um you know it, it was it was an amazing kind of facility because so much was going on but it was kind of add-ons rather than developed all the way through but you know that they they were great they they the one thing i think that was really good about that and you know i'm still very good friends with mark was actually the fact that they just had that open space of dialogue you could come up with an idea and you could hear a new idea and then have the ability to go brilliant let's give it a go now the problem is now is that if you said right we want to bring in a new a new piece of kit is how much it costs is the first thing whereas at the time because they were on that role they probably had more ability to change than most people get the chance in their careers it was a great time for them yeah no that does that does sound really interesting i mean you mentioned about having an open forum on those things one of the things that you see some of them very highly publicized about clashes within both within and say a medical department maybe but then also with management and so on have you had any any instances where you've had um, big clashes between maybe even like a doctor, physio, sports science? Um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think particularly. There's um, certainly nothing in terms of in terms of uh, physio or medical or the way I manage things. I, I haven't. I have seen it at other clubs quite a lot. Um, sometimes it's been different in terms of the sports science and the medical department. Um, they've often in clubs almost had a little bit where they're both trying to justify their existence against each other rather than working together. Um, a particular instance for me was when we were at West Brom uh, with Brian Robson, um, the, the, the fitness coach that came in there was Richard Hawkins, who's obviously at, at Man United now. And it was really obvious to me that actually myself and Richard worked very closely and very well as a team where, you know, when someone was injured, we had a close collaboration as to what parts he was going to do and what parts I was going to do. And that really worked well. And it probably highlighted to me that although I'd worked with a lot of fitness coaches and, and got on well and there'd be no problems, it probably demonstrated quite when it works, how much better it is. And I think for me, he was, he really opened my eyes to making sure that there's a closer integration between the two departments. Whereas previously, I kind of looked after all the injured players and then the fitness coach I'd been working with, they looked after all the fit ones. And really there were, you know, it was only when I was saying someone's fit, I can now pass you on. Um, that was about the only time we really came in close contact. So I think Richard sort of opened my eyes to what's good. I've never particularly had any bad clashes, but I have heard of managers going mad at, at physios. Um, but I, again, I don't know whether it's luck or whether that's just the way it's been, but you know, I, I, I've always been a physio who's, felt strongly about what I do. I kind of really enjoy what I do and I would be willing to argue the toss with anyone about what I do. You know, I enjoy it. Um, but I, did, I didn't really have clashes in that way. Managers used to be quite happy with what I said and, and could see, I guess, that I was always trying to do the right thing. Yeah, yeah, well, no, that's, that's definitely good. Do you think that it's gone too far in terms of like the, the size of medical departments now? Um, I think it's about, I think it needed to be better than it was. So it's certainly bigger. I think sometimes now what you notice is um, when teams become so big, it's about people justifying their job or justifying their role. And they then go and find things to do to make sure that no one's looking over their shoulder. Um, I certainly one of my experiences I feel is that quite a lot of junior staff always have that fear for their jobs. You know, if they do something wrong, someone's going to be telling them off or, or giving them the sack when actually you know, it should be about supporting junior staff and, and giving experience and sharing experience rather than a, a fear factor that you've got to not make a mistake. Um, I think it's about understanding the role and what you're there to do. So I think you've got to see within a team sport environment, you've got to see what you add. You know, there's loads of teams that will change their medical staff on a regular basis. And that's fine. They'll always be a head physio. They'll always be a head sports scientist, that type of thing. But if you're, if you're not that head person, what do you add to the team? If you weren't there for a week, what would they miss? And I think having that role that you can clearly define to say, yeah, actually, the thing I give is I might give psychological support to those long-term injured players. Well, that's an important part of the whole 
uh, team as a whole, as a whole, like a, as a family, you're adding that little bit to it. Sometimes it might be that, you know, you might be the kind of clown in the dressing room, but that's still really important. You know, sometimes you've got people that often it might be the master or the kit man, you know, they're really important parts of the team, but they may be the one that's the joke, uh, you know, but that's, that's part of it. It's everyone's got to have their place, but you've got to contribute, you know, and I think that's important. Mm. Well, we were talking about mental toughness just before we started this. Yeah. And it's a massive thing. I, I saw that you've done some NLP stuff. It's something which us at Physiquip, we're, we're all, all of us as a team are going to be doing that. Yeah. I, 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 like, talk me through your NLP experience. What was that? <laughs> and, well, my NLP was only a, a course I did years ago when I was at West Brom. And it, it was leading me on, really, because um, I felt that after, when you're dealing with a uh, a, a long-term injury so someone that might be out an ACL say what you're six to nine months or whatever it's going to be you're dealing with someone on a daily basis you're working with them through all of their tough times where they're struggling or they're in pain and, and all those family stuff and my my feeling was I just wanted to feel like I could communicate better and actually um, understand people in a better way so I did NLP because I was probably reading books around that at the time in the end, I, I, did a, I did a diploma um, in clinical hypnotherapy. I, I don't really do a lot of that, but it was more about learning the skills to be able to be an effective communicator about like motivational. So it's about like using the power of suggestion to um, help people understand what the point you're trying to get across. Now, for me in my clinical work now, working on sort of private patients, I find now if I do a technique that might be a bit sore, so I, let's say a manipulation, if I tell them what I expect them to feel, you know, so maybe today you might feel a little bit achy, a bit sore, it shouldn't be too bad, this is what you do, and I would expect you to feel better within a day, two days, this is how you do. If you give someone that suggestion of how they're likely to feel, then it's quite difficult for someone to go against that. You know, it would be if they're completely different to what they'd expect or if there was any difficulties. And generally, if you like, patients want to please you. You know, we'd all, your idea is to get a patient fit or work with them, but they want to please you to go, actually, yeah, you, what you've done has really helped me. So you, you both have that kind of positive outlook. And if you kind of build that by the relationship saying, you know, this is what I believe and this is how you can do it, speaking very positive words, it really does help the relationship. And I do think it puts people um, on, the, on the track to recovery. So I did all of that type of thing. And then the mental toughness, it led, led on from that was you initially just dealing with long-term injured play, players at football clubs. Because there were times when people were, um, you know, struggling with ACL injuries and they go through that bit where they, they've done really well for a few weeks and they hit that plateau where they don't seem to improve before they hit the next plateau where they go up. And in the end, sometimes I just go, look, look, just go home for two or three days. We need space away from each other. You know, you don't need to hear my voice. I don't need to hear yours, you know different now with bigger teams because you've got the ability to drop people in and drop people out of rehab but actually having the ability to go you know what have a few days away clear your head come back motivated in a couple of days time and, and sometimes doing that that really helped and I think the mental toughness thing about being positive and your outlook really has has helped me throughout the rest of my career I would say. It's really interesting, isn't it, though? So then you, you, you are looking at it from a psychological perspective, then, just seeing what each person needs, which I guess is what you need to do as a physio anyway for that, from that engagement. But certainly yeah. with that players, that you, you get to know them, you may know them really well. Um, yeah. I mean, does it ever cross over? For, would you ever call the players friends of yours? Um, I, I learned, I was taught very early on when I was at Sheffield Wednesday, one of the things that, I mean, Dave Gully was my, was, was the first team physio at the time, and obviously we know Dave for a long time, and he always said, you know, look, look make sure you understand that there's a difference, and, and very rarely have I ever gone out with players, I've done your Christmas do when you do that type of thing, but very rarely, um, but I would say now sort of over time, probably more now you don't work with them, you actually still speak to players, I, I mean, and I have, I have players um, from years and years ago that still contact me. And, and it's quite, and one of the nicest things is if a player that I was working with, I mean, you know, one of them working with at Sheffield Wednesday as a player, he still phones me if he has an issue. Now that's just about trust. I mean, you know, he must have, he must have hundreds of physios he's met in his career or people, but if there's a problem, he'll pick up the phone and go, Nick, I've got this problem with this. And that, that's a lovely feeling. Mm -hmm. um, but probably I don't regard them as friends while I'm working. 
because although you are close to them, you know, there's that point where players are an asset to a club. They'll come and they'll go, and it's not your decision whether they're kept or not. You know, they'll be brought in and they'll be moved on. But on the flip side is if there's a contentious issue and the player's getting a bit of trouble, you could suddenly become the blame. You know, so there's always that point where if a player's under pressure, they can turn on you. So it's good to have that that distance. Friendly, but not friends, I would say. Yeah, yeah, it probably sounds like a wise move. <laughs> you've mentioned like you mentioned a few people that you've worked with in the past. Like, what's the relationship with other physios or medical teams when you're working for a team? You obviously you may be a real competition with those teams. Like, do you talk a lot? Do you talk about injuries? Um, I, I think I think that used to happen a lot. I know, and again, this is showing showing my age. Is that obviously all those those early FA days, having the days down in Lillyshaw with. Um, with, uh, with Alan Hodson and, and Chip Wilkinson, those types of people, they were fantastic. And there was a real sense of togetherness. Now, most of it was about going and having a drink, but it was very much that, that you know, you would chat and phone each other up if you had an issue. You know, I saw that you had someone who did an injection last week. The, the chap that normally does ours is away. Who would you recommend? And there was that. It's slightly gone away from that a little bit, but I would certainly say that... Um, there wasn't particularly a lot of competition. There was only one or two physios, I would honestly say, that I wasn't madly keen on. But that's a personality thing. You know, it's not, you don't actually see how they work. You know, you, you, you know they put their, sta- their team out on the pitch. But, you know, some of those people that have been in the game for, you know, for, for a long time, you know, one of, for me, one of the best physios I ever met, and I'm still sort of friends with him now, is Dave Fever. You know, he's been in the game such a long time. And every time you meet him, he, 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 almost, he almost exudes... Um, you know, excellent. Um, and uh, for me, he's, he would be what I would regard as someone who I um, always looked up to as a physio. But, you know, you did have time for each other. And, and that, you know, the people like the, you know, the Gary Loons of this world, uh, you know, and Derek, Derek right up in New- Newcastle, they were people you used to speak to every now and again. Um, I still think there is a good, a good uh, atmosphere between people. Certainly, I do a lot of work with the Football Medical and Performance Association, so the FMPA with Eamon Salmon. Um, when you do the, the conference in the summer, there's still that very much that togetherness, but there is a little bit of, of angst. I think, I think people are always worried in case someone says, oh, you know, you know, Man United are doing this or Chelsea are doing that, when actually the thing is we are doing fairly similar things. There's not a million th- things that are new. You know, they might have an edge and someone's doing something, but it will be found out about and everyone will be doing it before too long. I think I do think there's that type of attitude. So do you think that in terms of that, Ben, if, if say, for example, someone comes in, a salesperson like me comes in and set, talks to you about, right, this system has been bought by X, Y and Z. Yeah. Does that make you take note or does it make you think, I don't care, I want to find my own way of, of doing things <laughs> I, I was just thinking about how many times you have done that Andy. <laughs> um, no, I, I think realistically the one thing is is that you get so many people trying to sell you things particularly when you're in the Premier League every week someone's trying to sell you the latest thing or a new different way of doing things the point is is that I think as a clinician you've got to be sensible that you're not just going for things just because you've got to you might have a budget or you might have only a small window of getting a few things in. So you've got to kind of shop around and say, what's important? Um, so I think, you know, yes, you do listen to everything. And sometimes, you know, there are people who you'd always just say no to because you kind of know the kind of sales pitch you're going to get. But on a whole, it's, it's good to know what other people are doing. Um, the problem is, I guess, I would probably say I'd always have a healthy scepticism when someone says, oh, you know, this player's using it or this club's using it. You know, I would phone the physios and going, what do you think of this? And they'd be going, oh, no, he came to me last week. And, you know, so there is that bit of, I, I kind of know some of its sales. But also, one of the things that's really good is when you do hear about something positive that's happening, getting the sales pitch is one thing, but the best thing is actually phoning a, a colleague of yours that you trust and them saying, yeah, we've used it and it really has been surprising at quite the, the output or the outcomes we've had. That's normally probably the best way to, to sell it is actually getting like-minded people to say, yeah, actually, yeah, this, this does make a difference and this is a game changer. That's the really, that would make me go, oh, brilliant. If they're using it and he trusts it, that's good for me. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm always happy to not do any sales. I'm happy to get <laughs> one of you guys to do it for us. That's always good. Yeah. Um, just going back to a point I was 
forgot to mention before was I know that there's one, it was a Premier League team at the time. When they were building their new training centre, they actually limited the number of beds that they were going to have in the treatment room. I mean, purely it's like, right, the beds are full, you can't get treatment, so get back on the, the training pitch. What do you think of that as a, um, as a message? That was directly from the manager, apparently. Yeah, I th well, I think, I mean, I think there's lots of that type of thing. I, I, I've heard of that. I've, I've also heard of, you know, well, I, I mean, it certainly happened to me where managers have gone, you know, bring them in early and keep them late at night and that kind of thing and, you know, work them hard all, all day. And, I, you know, the thing is, you've got to say, yes, there's a point where you need to, you know, it's not, it's not an easy ride being injured. But on the flip side, if you just absolutely hammer someone, then it's going to be overload and you're not going to get them motivated. So there is a balance to be had with that. Some of the old fashioned ways of just run them and run them and run them. You know, luckily that happens less. I'm not saying it never happened. Um, I think with the treatment thing, yeah, it's all very well. But ultimately, if you're the physio, you're the full guy. The manager isn't the one that's telling them, look, I'm sorry, you're going to have to come back in three quarters of an hour because I'm busy with these four people. You know, you're the one that takes the flat from the players um, and it isn't easy. But you know, yeah, there's got to be a compromise, but managers will always like to have their influence in every aspect of the club. You've got to stand your ground. I don't agree with it, but it's kind of part of the game, I guess. Yeah. You know, and, and then if that manager moves on, because for whatever happened, they do, then would you change it in the end? Well, again, some of those things work well. So, you know, sometimes it helps you because you, if you've only got, let's say, four beds and you can only deal with four, those four people, well, great. That might mean your workload is a bit less stressed at one point. So, you know, sometimes there are benefits that you wouldn't anticipate. It shouldn't always be used. I don't like the idea of medicine or sports science being used as a punishment very much. I mean, you know, sometimes it can be, but, you know, it should, we're doing something that's positive, that's helpful. It shouldn't be regarded as, you know, you're doing extra because you're, you're being punished because then that takes away from actually the good stuff we're doing. Mm. Yeah, and then on the flip side, then from the player's perspective, if you're doing a treatment which you think is the right thing to do for them, they're just like, I, no, don't like that. Don't, doesn't feel good. Yeah, you're thinking, well, maybe it should do. Like, what, what, how would you manage that sort of situation? I think that's where the relationship and the conversation needs to come in. You know, the loads of times I've done the, uh, you know, sitting in a room with just myself and the player, or myself, the doctor and the player, and and there's a. It's difficult because there's so much out there in terms of agents, uh, other coaches, other players, social media, saying what people should and shouldn't have. Um, I think you've got to justify what you do. Um, back it up with research to a point. You know, you, if you're only theoretical and you're only evidence-based, you'll never do anything new. But also you've got to take into, the, into account the player's, the player's opinion and their previous experience. You know, if someone's had an injury you know, five years ago in their career at another club, you might as well just say, well, what worked then? Because if they're happy with that and you get success, there's no one way to treat any injury as far as I'm concerned. So, for example, if a player comes in with a torn hamstring, you, Andy, would have one way of dealing with them and I would have a different one. Neither one's right or wrong. So long as the player gets fit in a reasonable amount of time safely, it doesn't matter. And I think that's also part of what I would I probably experience tells me is it's not all about, we don't all have to do the same thing. You know, you just, you know, a, a tissue like a, like a muscle will heal at the, an appropriate rate. We're not changing nature. We're just kind of working and giving it optimal conditions to, to heal the best it can. Um, but that's where I think we've got to be a little less ego driven and more about going, actually, at the end of the day, the player or the patient is the, is the, is the goal. And if it makes him happy to have a treatment that I think is, is wrong, so long as I don't think it's going to harm or hold back his recovery, I'm quite happy with that. You always hear that, that kind of story or that comment of, you know, would you wear a pink ribbon in your hair if you were, you know, if it made you play well on a Saturday? Well, yeah, if I had any hair and I could put a pink ribbon in it, I possibly would. You know, the things that, as long as it's not going to do him any harm, anything to get performance better. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, it makes sense. Good answer. So you've ended up in some some interesting jobs then. So as I mentioned before, how did like the Abu Dhabi one help? Yeah, well, I, I finished at uh, I finished at Bolton uh, at the end of the season that was 2010, um, and actually very briefly then I, I I got the job and I was I was touring. I toured very briefly with U2, so I was that was kind of looking after the drummer for a brief. Uh, that was a bit of a I, 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 it, was a, it was a job that was advertised on Physio Bob, 
but it was a, a kind of mystery one. You know, I didn't really know what I was getting into and it was quite secretive. So I did that for a, few, for a couple of months. And then um, actually um, Mark Waller, who, who used to be the Liverpool doctor, he's now up at Rangers. Um, he was offered the job in Abu Dhabi as the, as the doctor. Um, and then fairly soon after going there, uh, Gerard Houllier wanted him to be his doctor at, at Aston Villa. So I've been friends with Mark for a long time. We worked together at the England under 21s and he knew I was out of work and he phoned and he said, look, there's an opportunity. Would you be interested? And I was phoned on the Wednesday and went out on the Saturday for an interview. And within two weeks, so it wasn't part of a big plan. Within two weeks, I was over there and, and li lived there for three years. And it, a brilliant, brilliant experience. It's not like normal real life. Um, and the football is very, very, very different. But the idea was is to bring some Premier League experience over there. And um, the club I worked at, Al Jazeera, um, is owned by Sheikh Mansour, who owns Man City. And they'd never won the league. So they had all the best facilities, the best stadium and all the rest of it, but never won the league. So in that first year I was there, um, we, we won the league and cup. We won the, uh, the league the year after. So, you know, it's, it's been very proud that I was part of that. Um, but yeah, it kind of came about out of almost nowhere. So it, well, I didn't apply for it. Someone, someone knocked on my door and said, look, do you fancy it? And I've always been someone who's gone, yeah, I'll give it a go. So I kind of did that and had three good years at it. Yeah, that's amazing. Did you ever feel like you were missing out from doing, well, I guess you'd moved out of football anyway with, with doing the U2 stuff, but did you miss being in the, the English league? Yeah, I mean, the thing about it was I, I didn't quite know what was going to happen regarding uh, when I left Bolton. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I, you know, I've had, when I work out, sort of just over 20 odd years in football. So I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I was quite open to anything, um, you know, so I wasn't kind of desperate to do anything in that way. I'd started doing a bit of lecturing at that point. So did three years abroad, but it was still football. So that was quite nice. Um, and then, and then came back after three years and wasn't sure what I was going to do. Then started lecturing at Salford University because I was doing a little bit of that before. And I also teach for the Society of Musculoskeletal Medicine. So I was doing all that kind of thing and then, and then had the opportunity to go um, and work at Wigan very briefly with Malcolm Mackay. So I only worked there for a few months just to, towards the end of the season, but it was like a temporary contract. Um, so yeah, it, I've kind of always been... Um, I missed, I missed the kind of idea that the football was, was good in, was in the UK. Premier League football is great, um, you know, or even like, like Championship or League One, League Two. So it was different because in Abu Dhabi, um, crowds were small, very small. Um, although we played in the Champions League, the Asian Champions League, and we, you know, I went over to Iran and played in about 110, 120,000. So, you know, it, it differed. So I kind of always have been open to whatever opportunities out there. So even now, you know, if, if football came along, yeah, I'd be interested. But on the other side, I've not worked in a club for four years now. So, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm kind of just, I use my kind of musculoskeletal skills working under pressure. I use them now in, in my other sort of area because I now, I now am a lead clinician for a big company. So, you know, working in terms of clinical development and support for, for junior physios now. So, I still do a lot of work um, related to sport. I'm often a second opinion for a lot of players at different clubs, um, either in academy level or, or pros. They come and see me privately. I also do expert witness work. So if, if a player is suing a, a club or a physio, then there's not many people who do it in football. So, um, yeah, I'm an expert witness for physio. So all of the major cases that have happened in the last 10 or 15 years, I've been involved in almost every single one giving an opinion so yeah it's uh it's interesting and challenging but again it, it keeps you that distance so i've got i've got my toe in the water of football or professional sport but yeah i, I don't miss the overnights and being on call 24 hours a day you know and, and no holidays so yeah, there's swings and roundabouts with that yeah well you toured with you too for two months so that must have been uh <laughs> you know, time. were you all the concerts as well yeah, well the, well, the thing was, is that I was dealing with a drummer. Um, he'd had a back injury, um, and it was the year that they pulled out of Glastonbury because uh, Bono had had a back injury. So, obviously, Bono had taken the attention, so the drummer had had something similar. Um, and, it, and it was great. I mean, look, I had a great time for a few months. I was, I was flown around in the U2 private jet with them. Um, I was under the stage where they were on top, but I was, I was basically kind of a glorified sports masseur. I used to do soft tissue work. We used to do work with them. 
did a bit of rehab, was down in the south of France with them. He'd get on the plane, go across Europe, do the gig in the evening, and then like two, three o'clock in the morning, he'd fly back. He'd live in the south of France. And, and that was the kind of thing. But it wasn't particularly sustainable with a young family, but mm. it, was a, it was a great experience, a great fun. And, and I did love it. I mean, and I, you know, I was really well looked after. It was a fantastic experience. But yeah, uh, as, a, as, a, as a, having a young family at the time, it, it wasn't conducive to family life particularly, but it was good fun. No, no, well, I'm on tour with you two. Can't, can't, can't do it tonight, well, sorry. <laughs> so what were they like as a personality set then? Were you mixing in with them much? Yeah, I did. I mean, as I say, I got to know the, the, the drummer Larry Mullen Jr. very, very well and obviously all of his family. But yeah, we, were, we weren't particularly, you know, it was always, you know, that they were the, um, the, the, the talent, if you like. But, you know, when we were at hotels and we were staying overnight, you'd often be down having breakfast and they'd come and sit and chat with you. Um, some of them more accommodating than others. But generally speaking, they were very nice. And it, the big thing is, is just the, the size of the entourage. So you have people that are looking after them and they're doing all of the kind of the, the, the costumes and, and, and makeup and the sound guys, but all of them, all of the lighting and the sound rigs and, the, and it was just amazing to watch happen. It was just, it was just a brilliant experience, but yeah, it was, it was something completely out of the ordinary. Um, but, you know, doing things like that was, you know, for me, that's why I would say you've got to kind of say yes to things that push you outside your comfort zone. That certainly did. And it was great, but yeah, I've done things for sport relief. I've, I've done some of their, uh, charity gigs where I've been the super cycle that was done with Alan Shearer and, and Adrian Charles in 2000 and let me think I think it was 2006 2007 so they cycled from Newcastle to London via via the Hawthorns for West Brom so you know and, and doing things like that great great experience different doing something different a few days of, of, of learning a new skill and being part of that team but yeah doing that kind of thing is still really enjoyable. Mm. Um, I've gone way over the 30 minutes here, so I won't Sorry. give any more questions. No, it's my fault. So this, I've got loads to ask as well. But like, who would you say, have you come across any one person or more than one person that's that inspired you or particularly impressed you in your work life? Um, I, think, I think with that is, is that there's always people that sort of inspire you in terms of their work ethic and their, their interest. I think probably, like I say before, as a, as a physio and someone who I would say would be someone who I would look to would be Dave Fever in terms of the way he works and I like his kind of very um, very simple kind of do again get the basics right type of approach as a sports scientist I've always liked working with, with Richard Hawkins who I mentioned earlier on um, so they would probably be the, t the, the two individuals that I would sort of pick out in in particular always enjoy having conversations with different people that that, that challenge you so kind of Grant Downey's always a person that you that I speak to, I like the way he thinks about things. And, and it, it's slightly, I think we share a lot of, of ideas, but also he thinks of things in a slightly different way. So you pick up different ideas with that. So yeah, there would be people in terms of sport wise that have, that have inspired me in terms of, uh, you look at their careers and, and like, and it's about not always following the research. You know, it's about having the research, understanding it, interpreting it and then coming up with your own ideas so you know we don't all have to think alike and we don't all have to kind of um believe that there's one way to treat a, a you know a, a sprained ankle it's not like that there's you know if you did nothing people will get better on their own you know it's about just trying to do what feels well feels good for you and works with the player i think dave fever would be very jealous of that u2 gig i went to a, a foo fighters concert with him in new york once and I've never seen him so excited. You know. <laughs> no, I know he does, he does like his music. Yeah, no, he does. Um, and also Thailand, so uh, touched on that. How did that one come about? Well, Thailand was only very briefly. That was, that was, a, that was through uh, working with um, uh, at Man City at the time with their academy. So uh, the Thailand national team were, were over in Manchester, so I didn't get to do the Thailand thing. I was offered the job about whether I could have toured with them. Um, but at the time, I, I actually, at the time I was doing that, I'd got the job at Bolton. So I, I was moving, I knew I was going to be moving within a, a couple of weeks, so it didn't happen. But yeah, the Thailand was, I was working with the academy at, at uh, Man City, covering when um, uh, Stuart Millwood um, had had a, an operation. So I was covering there, and it was at the time of Sinawatra there. So they brought them over, and I was working with them, preparing for some World Cup qualifying gig, uh, games. So I was working with them. So that was really good and I was and they kind of liked what I did and invited me to go but again I, I was 
getting the job at, at Bolton at the time and working in the Premier League was too big a draw to, to, to stay in and actually be able to, to, to continue my football career at that point, which was the biggest thing for me. Yeah, well, probably a good job not to have backed Shinna Watcher at that point as well. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so finally, how do you think that you've changed as a physio over this, that, that period? Um, I mean, obviously, that you know, experience is always going to be the thing that, that changes you. I think, I think probably um, at the earlier stages of my career, I probably did feel that I was really important to the team. You know, that I really made a difference as a physio, that it was, you know, I made the difference between people playing and winning and all the rest of it. And as you kind of get on there, and particularly when you lose your job and you're out of it, you actually realise you know, football's still going to go on whether you're there or not. You're only there for a set amount of time, however long it's to be. You know, enjoy it while it lasts because it's a great, it's a great life and a great, uh, the glamorous side of it's good. You have to put up with a lot of, of rubbish and a lot of um, negativity and people kind of hammering you at times. So enjoy it while it lasts for, for what you're doing. I think probably I've kind of relaxed about my job. I realised that it is about just kind of making it simple, uh, not overcomplicating it. Um, and probably that mental aspect. Aspect, the fact that the psychology of a recovery because when you're dealing with someone who's injured they might be losing money because they're not got appearance money they might be having a bad time at home because they're not sleeping or they're not very happy with their partner or family you know understanding that and getting under the skin of a player at that point really makes a big difference on how their recovery may be um, you know structured on the way forward so I would probably say taking away the physio and thinking more of the supportive mentor type person, that's probably more important. Great. No, well, that's a good time to finish. Nick, thank you very much for that. Really interesting. I actually could have gone on there. So I'm sure. <laughs> well, thanks, Andy. I really appreciate the invitation. No problem. Thank you. Bye bye.